302 citizen report several syringes in the parking lot of 1345 Oakland near Jefferson. 302 dispatch. I've been stuck by a hypodermic going to the med center. Syringe exchange programs provide sterile syringes and they enable the safe disposal of used syringes. If we lower the number of contaminated syringes, we reduce the risk of infection. You know, from time to time you do get officers that get needle sticks. Once again, it's something that if there's a, a needle exchange program and everybody's aware of it, knows it's there, and the clients that are utilizing it have spoken with the needle exchange program, which in this case, they, obviously they do, they know that if they're approached, they can say to an officer, I do have a needle on me, uh, I'm part of the needle exchange program, you know, they're able to give them their card. Even if they don't have the card, they're able to, to explain, you know, I was just up the street, that's where I was. And it keeps that, that incident, that, uh, you know, potential incident where somebody could be going through some serious medical treatment because of a needle, needle stick, it, it, it helps try to eliminate those. I uh, walked over and I saw about six to eight needles laying on the ground. Uh, they were all capped. I saw the orange caps uh, on the tip of the needles. Um, I put my medical gloves on and began to, uh, to pick them up. Uh, as I walked around and picked them up, I was just setting them in my hand um, with the needles all facing one direction. I picked them all up, I walked over to my patrol car, and I went to set them on the, f on the floor of my car, and as I set them down, they rolled down my hand, and one of the needles was sticking out of the cap, and as it rolled, it went through my glove, poked me, and continued down. And the only reason why I knew I got stuck is when the needle came out, uh, it grabbed my glove and pulled on my glove. So I took my glove off and saw that I was, uh, I was bleeding there on the palm of my hand. In 84, most of our uh, patients were, who had HIV were drug addicts, usually injection drug users. And, um, you know, it was, it was pretty traumatic. We had four or five deaths a day in the hospital. So as a young doctor, that was pretty harrowing because there was nothing you could do. You just had to help people die with some dignity. But um, things have changed tremendously, especially since 96 with the advent of, you know, antiretroviral cocktails and certainly with the reduction in, in uh, using dirty needles or sharing needles. So that has reduced dramatically. So in the 80s and the 90s, we saw most of our folk who got HIV infected were infected from maybe 50 percent of them from using or sharing needles and that's been cut dramatically to less than four percent across the state, which is great. I understand there's a pushback from some about syringe programs, but for those of us in law enforcement, we have to understand that these programs are authorized by law and that possession of these program syringes is lawful. Also, in 2010, the penal law was changed. It used to be a violation of seventh degree, criminal possession of a controlled substance, to possess any amount of a controlled substance. But now residual amounts of a controlled substance in or on a program syringe is not a crime. It's not a violation. We want users to be able to properly dispose of used syringes. So this law allows users to safely return syringes to a disposal site without fear of arrest. This is so if you want to get in and out anonymously and just get your syringes, you're just able to do that. And so we've got that space. We've got you know, rapid HIV and hepatitis C testing right here in this kind of mini drop-in center. Um, also, people can wait for their counselors uh, and case managers. Um, and so we try to keep it barrier-free, as low threshold as possible. So whatever level of engagement that you're ready to, to do, you can come in and do that. If it's just clean syringes, you can come in and get clean syringes if you want to receive counseling or social work services or mental health services or health care or pharmacy or housing placement assistance, we can do that. Um, and I think the, this model, we're kind of building it as, as we go, but what we did realize early on is the more services that we can wrap around the syringe exchange in a deeper way, the more opportunities we're going to have to be able to change people's lives and for them to become healthier, not just with their addiction just healthier with their social relationships, healthier with their mental health and their physical health. That's really what it's about. And then we also did the, um, the Check Hep C program, that is a fantastic program here that folks are now getting more engaged into HCV you know, care. 
and it's fantastic because now a lot of people are getting the awareness because a lot of us have this disease don't even know it. So you know, and especially the folks that are IV drug users, you know, and it's a simple thing. It's, you know, you know, it can be the needle, it can be the cooker, it can be the the cotton ball. You know, it doesn't take a lot of blood for someone to be infected. Treatment only works about 10% of the time for you know somebody who's going in for their first round. Okay, so the question is, what do we do? with the 90% of people who fail at treatment the first time around. Do we write those folks off, or do we try to provide some other interventions for them? So when they come in, they get information on you know, how to use in a way that they're not going to acquire a disease, uh, whether that be HIV or hepatitis C. Um, we tell them you know, how to use safely so they don't harm, them, harm themselves. You, know, you can get things like uh, heart infections from injecting. Obviously, we don't want people to, to go through those kind of things either. But the other thing is, um, we're here to help steer people into treatment through some of the other programs we have in-house. You know? And we ask people that question. You know? It's like, have you had enough yet? Are you ready to try treatment? Or are you ready to try treatment again, you know, if that's the case with the person? But you know, the point of all this is we have the same goal in mind as the folks who work in law enforcement and the folks who work in treatment. Uh, we're on the same page. So this is, the van we're actually on today is one of our larger vehicles. Um, we have um, two or three other smaller vehicles and we go out to a variety of sites across the city. So we're going to Brooklyn, uh, we're here in East Harlem today, we also go to sites in the South Bronx. Um, and each vehicle, um, I mean this one is great because we have two spaces available. You know, we have this space where we can do our syringe exchange and give out the syringes and the other equipment that people need. People can dispose of their syringes safely. And then we also have a back space where people can do um, you know, the testing, the one-to-one -one counseling, um, the, the intakes if they need to, you know, more time to do an intake. It saves lives. Um, we know that a lot of our clients would not have access to safe equipment if, uh, if our exchange wasn't available to them. Um, they would be reusing needles or you know, renting, borrowing, doing whatever possible. And some of the stories that we hear from our clients, uh, the bottom line is uh, they've all told us it's very important to have our program here because it keeps them safe and it keeps their friends safe as well. The majority of calls for the, uh, the hospital unwanted subject is somebody that you know, is creating a scene there or somebody that's trying to get some pain medication that they've already been there earlier, they've already cleared. He started to, tearing away from me and go at the same time, so I just grabbed the whole of him by his down comforter, and when I did, the needle stick went right through him. my gloves, through his jacket, and just stuck me in the finger. So when you're supposed to take the cocktail, if you will, for the hepatitis and the HIV, and was around there, and I had asked the nurses what their opinion was, and. They said, you know, it makes you sick and ill and all that kind of stuff. But I had two young kids at home and, you know, I surely went ahead and took it. And uh... Just knowing that there's a syringe exchange program in the area should be comforting to police because with that syringe exchange programs come, are, are attached other benefits for the patient that can help them modify behaviors. So the harm reduction approach and counseling and trying to get that person into care and services that they need, that's one thing. I think the other is that, um, you know, thinking back to the 80s and through the 90s, I did see syringes lying around the street. Um, it was kind of common and I don't see that anymore. So I think that people knowing where they can go to dispose of needles is important. Also what we try and do with police officers is always explain to them this is beneficial to you as well, especially in terms of preventing needle sticks or if God forbid you get a needle stick that you're much less likely to get stuck by a needle that contains HIV anymore, or, you know, not so much hepatitis C, but um, you know, that, that it's protecting them. Uh. You know, there was a study of uh, police officers in Rhode Island and it showed that almost 30% had been stuck by a needle during their career, and more than 27% had two or more needle sticks. And then there was a study of police officers in Connecticut. Uh, that study found that needle stick injuries were reduced by 66% after the implementation of syringe exchange programs. Um, if they're new to the exchange, we'll enroll them. It is an anonymous, anonymous uh, 
enrollment process. So we create an ID card and we explain the rules of the program as well as the legalities around possession of syringes. And then from there, we'll offer them whatever supplies they may need until they can return to the exchange. Um, so what actually works out beautifully in this office is that we have the combination of the syringe exchange and this ECHO program where we are able to in a very fluid way bring clients who express their need to or want to um, seek treatment into this other program that is then able to provide more one-on-one, -on -one, more type case management type um, services to a person. They can make phone calls for that person to treatment facilities. They can bring the person to the facility um, and also do one-on-one -on -one counseling to help that person get to the point in which they're ready to stop. Focusing more so our peer delivery on women to, to making sure that they have access to, to sterile syringes and their, their appropriate equipment and education and training around injecting drug use because they were not coming into this facility and probably other facilities. So I, it's been very hard because of the, the issues with child care, employment, and everything else. So uh, basically, there's a peer who works in SCP, and they have uh, social networks in their social networks, so they have contacts. So when that individual in the community wants syringes or needs syringes, they call either they can call the syringe exchange coordinator or they can call that specific peer the PDSE peer, and we will go and deliver to their, their homes or wherever they want us to meet them at, uh, if it's around the corner from their homes or wherever we need to go to get them the equipment they need. Well, I have a client list, and usually uh, um, on certain days when I'm out there, I have a listing of, of numbers for my clients, and they know where to meet me at on a specific date, and they'll bring in their dirty needles, I'll collect them and put them in a, a hazmat container, and I'll, I'll issue clean syringes to them. Understanding more about what the needle exchange program is, understanding the public health model that, that, it, that it helps uh, create, and the fact that it really does also increase our officer safety. Um, also took away some of the, uh, uh, some of the, 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 the feelings that we might have had, like, oh, well, is crime going to increase? You know, or all of a sudden we're going to have you know, a heroin user breaking into a car because they know that now they can get their needle, um, which we haven't seen, which has been very nice. Um, and then also being able to, um, every once in a while, when unfortunately we get a, a case of an overdose, to be able to reach out to them and say, hey, this is what we're seeing, this is what's going on, um, can you get that out to, 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 your, to your clients? So that way we don't have another um, overdose. Um, a lot of the clients we see are clients that really struggle to engage with traditional health services. They may have had really bad experiences in the past, they may feel ashamed of going to other places for, you know, for services, um, they may not even know where to go or how to navigate the system. Um, so it's really meaningful in terms of you know, engaging them here at what, in terms of what they need and can get from us here, um, but also connecting them onto other services, whether it be referrals for treatment, uh, detox, rehab, um, healthcare. Um, mental health services, uh, pantry services. We do a little bit of our own pantry, but often we're connecting people for more food services if they're struggling with that, housing services. So a whole range of kind of, you know, you, you kind of meeting people here and then connecting them on where possible. This needle exchange program, what it really does is it helps us deal with the safety issue of heroin um, and it doesn't take any of our resources. And if we get a lot of neighborhood complaints, and this does happen from time to time, or if we're having an issue and it turns out to be a location where they're selling heroin, that doesn't stop us from doing what we need to do on an investigation and shutting that down. We've shut down houses where they're dealing heroin since the needle exchange program has opened up. Um, it wasn't happening because the needle exchange program opened up. It was happening because those things happen. Um, we haven't you know, turned around and said, well, heroin's legal in the city of Albany. We've continued to say heroin is very illegal in the city of Albany, but there is a needle exchange program that's legal and that keeps um, the users safer, keeps the community safer. Syringes obtained under New York State's syringe exchange program, the expanded syringe access program, or under the opioid overdose prevention program are lawfully possessed. So how do you tell the difference between a program syringe and others? On its face, you can't. Uh, through an interview, you might be able to, but I think we have to ask ourselves, what's the big picture here? Check the statistics. Since New York State enacted syringe exchange laws over 20 years ago, there's been a reduction in the spread of infectious disease. Um, it really goes to our community policing philosophy. We can't do it all by ourselves. 
And if all we're doing is arresting people for possession of a syringe and having that get tossed in court anyways, because they were going to, to a legally sound um, practice of, of an exchange program, it, it's just, there's no use. It, it's just, it's actually creating more barriers for us to do our jobs. You know, in law enforcement, we're already using harm reduction strategies, and we have been. Uh, speed limits and seatbelt laws that help reduce crashes and the severity of injuries when there is a crash. We've also reduced alcohol-related injuries and fatalities by lowering the BAC threshold from 0.10 to 0.08. And we reduce head injuries by requiring helmets for motorcycles and some bicyclists and skaters. These are all types of harm reduction. Copy 3402.